So welcome to this disjoint event, a collaboration between the Methodist Church Learning Network and Methodist Homes, MHA. My name is Kate Lasswer and I'm Head of Chaplaincy North uh, with MHA. Now, just in case you don't know, a very, very brief background to MHA. Uh, we were founded in 1943 with the backing of the Methodist Conference to provide care for people in later life before the welfare state came into being. The first home was opened in Surrey in 1945 and we now have 89 care homes, 70 retirement living communities and 48 MHA communities groups and a whole host of online activities that can be accessed by anyone anywhere. Now, like every part of society, uh, we in MHA have faced a whole variety of losses over the past 18 months. There have been many deaths from COVID, of course, too many, far too many. And there have been other kinds of loss too. Um, deaths from other causes, loss of contact when visitors were not allowed, loss of cognitive ability due to advancing dementia, loss of time with loved ones, and loss of many opportunities of all kinds. Opportunities to say goodbye, to mark those deaths, to celebrate births and marriages, to share triumphs and disasters. But one of the things that marks MHA out as different from other care providers is our chaplaincy service. We have a chaplain in every care home and in most of our retirement living schemes. And we have a digital chaplain too. And over the summer, some of our chaplains started to pick up tensions between those who wanted to put COVID firmly in the past and move forwards, and those who still have grieving and processing to do. And we thought that if that's how it is in MHA, then it's very likely that there will be many others out there who also aren't quite ready to leave behind all of these difficult experiences that we've been through. And so that's how this webinar came into being. So if, if we're going to be supporting our chaplains as they in turn support those in their care, then there might be others involved in pastoral care, we thought, who would want to join us in thinking about that. So we have a variety of speakers this afternoon who will talk about grief and guilt and moral injury and about memorials. And in between, we're going to offer some short practical exercises that you can share with the people you care for that can help alleviate distress. So Abby will lead us in these exercises for ourselves, but the idea is that you can then use those with other people. And then as Trisha said, we'll have a, a Q&A with all the speakers. So be putting your questions into the, the chat as we go along and, uh, and we'll be keeping an eye on them uh, for later and pulling out some of those common questions and common themes. But before we um, get started properly, um, I just want to say a quick word about looking after ourselves. You know, we, we all know how important that is, especially when we're providing pastoral care for other people. But we're not always so good at acting on that knowledge. We're not always as good at saying to ourselves what we will say to other people. So I have three questions for you um, for now. You might like to just jot down your answers and we'll come back to them at the end. So these three questions, first of all, who do you talk to? When, when times are tough, who do you talk to? Then secondly, how do you care for yourself? What are the things that you do that, that look after you? And then thirdly, where is your safe place? Where do you go that is safe for you? So who do you talk to? How do you care for yourself? And where is your safe place? And we will just check back in with those at the end. But now I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Emma. Thank you. Um, so as Kate said, my name's Emma. I am a minister with the Free Methodist Church. I'm a chaplain at an MHA care home in Cramlington, and I'm an area support chaplain for MHA as well. So I look after the districts of Newcastle, Darlington and Yorkshire North and East. In my social media bios, I describe myself as being death positive. 
That just means that I think that talking about death and dying is a really good thing and that I'm working towards making it less taboo. And some people say, well, why is that? And it's simply so that we can work on decreasing people's anxiety about death, that we can help people to understand their options when it comes to end of life care and about death itself and what happens after they die. And also to encourage people to um, make it really okay to talk about how we're feeling when we do lose a loved one. I really want to stress that I don't class myself as an expert in any way, shape or form. I'm just passionate about this. I've lost loved ones of all ages. I've worked in hospice chaplaincy. I've worked in care home chaplaincy. And I also work as a funeral celebrant as well. So certain parts of my life are just surrounded by death and dying. And that's where I'm coming from today. So I've been asked to talk a bit about grief and what is normal in grief and things like that. If we're gonna be technical, Grief is the completely normal process which occurs as a reaction to a loss. We often think of it as an emotional response, but grief has also got physical and cognitive and spiritual and behavioural dimensions as well. And it is really important to note that grief is not just about death. The loss that precipitates the grief could be the death of a loved one, but it could also be a loss encountered with a relationship breakdown or losing one's job or even a diagnosis of a chronic illness, which means that the past normal that you knew and the planned future that you had have to change. Our whole webinar today is about dealing with the grief and loss associated with COVID-19. And as Kate said, many of us have experienced the death of loved ones during the pandemic, but everyone has experienced losses during these months. We've lost freedoms, some people have lost businesses, the loss of income and all the complicated emotions that are connected with that, including for some people, the loss of identity. We lost physical closeness. We were told we had to stay two metres away from people. We lost hobbies and interests. I play the steel pans and that's not something that I can just do in my bedroom. I have to go somewhere that has steel pans. It's not like a little flute that I can play. We lost hope and we lost time. And for some, that was the biggest loss of all, especially for those who maybe had loved ones who were approaching those final years anyway, or for those people who are living with dementia and have, you know, as Kate said, experienced um, a progression of that. Just yesterday, a friend of mine posted on social media the following, and I did ask her if I could read this. She said, does anyone else feel like they've lost a part of themselves during this pandemic? but they're not even sure what part that is. I just feel like a particular light has gone out, but I don't know which one or how to turn it back on. I just don't feel like myself. And that's the only way I can describe it. We can experience a loss even when we can't name it. And what's the normal response to loss? It's grief. When I lead a funeral, I often begin by um, saying to the people who are gathered that the day may come with a whole variety of emotions, that they may feel emotions they weren't expecting to feel, or they might not even know what it is that they're feeling at all. I encourage them just to be present for the time that we're there, to allow themselves to experience what goes on in that time and that place. And then towards the end of the service, I ask those gathered to acknowledge that they are saying goodbye and that there may be pain as they travel their journey of grief. I tell them that their journey will be unique. There's no right or wrong way to grieve. There's only their way. And more recently, I've expanded that to add that there's only their way for this time, because I've learned myself that that process of grief work changes as we do. And just because I've grieved one way at, at one point in time over one loss, doesn't mean that I'll grieve the same way over another loss at a different time. But whilst there's no such thing as normal grief, there are many things which are normal within grief. Some feelings you might feel. You might feel sad. You might feel lonely. You might feel lost or angry. You might feel relieved. You might feel guilty, resentful, anxious, numb. You might feel calm or you might feel distraught. And those emotions aren't stable. You can fly from one to another without warning, and that in itself can be quite disorientating. 
You might also find that you're experiencing physical symptoms, such as a tight chest or difficulty breathing, a real bone deep exhaustion, sleep problems, either sleeping too much or being unable to sleep. It might be a loss of appetite or an increased appetite, a dry mouth, a hollow feeling in the pit of your stomach and aches and pains all over. And then there's cognitive symptoms such as brain fog, problems with memory, the inability to make a simple decision and not being able to multitask. And these are all completely normal symptoms of grief. And the more that we talk about them, the more that we'll be able to accept them if we experience them and the better we'll be able to support other people when they experience them in their journeys of grief too. Now, I could have done a whole thing on grief models and all the symptoms that you could experience, but the fact is we've all got the internet and those are the kind of things that we can all look up. So I want to tell you a story um, because stories have a different kind of power. Around eight years ago, uh, we were told as a family that my nana had six weeks to live. We're a very small, very cl close knit family. So we sprang into action. My nana stayed in her own home and we looked after her 24 hours a day. Um, that meant that the bulk of the work was done by my mum and my auntie. They would do three or four nights each and then the rest of us would just chip in when we could. At that point, we started our journey of anticipatory grief. We knew that this wonderful woman who was the centre of our family was going to die and she'd been with us all for our whole lives. Three and a half years later, my nana was still asking the GP when she could expect this death to happen. By this point, we were no longer anticipating her death. And around four years after that initial and significantly in incorrect prognosis, my nana had a couple of weeks of being just not quite right. And then one evening while I was out dog sitting for a friend, I received a phone call I never wanted to receive. My mum had been staying with my nana because we were still providing that 24 hour care. And on the way to the bathroom, my nana just collapsed and she was gone in an instant. I found someone to come and look after the dog that I was dog sitting for. And I broke every speed limit on the way to get to my nana's house. And by the time I got there, the whole family were already gathered. Over the next few days, the truth of the uniqueness of people's grief became really clear. I took on all the practical things. I registered the death, I organised the funeral, I sorted out all the paperwork. My sister kept wanting the family to get together, to go out for a meal, to gather with each other and to talk about my nana. For the first couple of days I went along with this before I felt like, because I felt like it was expected. And then I broke and said, I can't do this. You see, my sister's an extrovert and she needed people around her in order to be able to express her grief and work through it. I'm an introvert. I needed to do the things and then I needed to be on my own. When, whilst my sister found comfort in the family being together, all I saw was the massive gaping hole where my nana should be. I took my nana's funeral. It was the first funeral I ever led and people kept commenting to me about how brave I was to do it, but I didn't feel brave. I didn't feel anything. And because everyone around me was wanting to gather and cry together, I felt like there was something very wrong with me. A few weeks later, I was at work and I found myself curled up in the corner of the office against the radiator with what I can only describe as a big black hole or a swirling vortex of doom in the pit of my stomach. I felt sick, but I felt empty. Later that day, I was driving home from work and I stopped off at a coffee shop um, and I got stuck. Whilst I was sat there, I realised I couldn't move. I managed to message a very good friend and she called me and realised that I was having a quiet panic attack. And she talked me through step by step to get me home. And then I called my GP. My journey of grief for my, for my nana was very different from my sister's journey of grief. It was completely different from my mum's journey of grief. And it was totally different from any other journey of grief that I've ever been on. I told you about my nana because stories are powerful and when we share our grief stories with one another we begin to see that although my story is unique you may well experience some of those symptoms in your own story and it might help you realise that you're not going insane when you're curled up against a radiator in the office at work. By normalising these characteristics of grief it just might make the whole thing a little bit more manageable. I'm going to hand over to Crispian to talk us through a bit more. 
Thank you, Emma, and for sharing that personal story. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Crispian. I am the other head of chaplaincy alongside Kate covering the South. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, about complicated grief and how that expresses itself and how it can sometimes lead to something being more commonly termed as moral injury. I should say as well that I've just started as a research student um, looking at uh, researching the role of chaplaincy and its effectiveness in community trauma. So I don't, I'm not an expert yet, but maybe in five years I'll have a couple of answers. Any death is traumatic for those left behind. And one hopes that a death is natural, painless and surrounded by loved ones. But we live in a fragile world and we are fragile human beings. It doesn't always work out the way we want it to. Terrorist attacks, burning buildings, road traffic accidents, natural disasters and many more are examples where loved ones are suddenly and unexpectedly taken from us or gone before their time. And in some circumstances then, those feelings and emotions and physical and mental pain that surround grief can last longer and become more difficult to deal with. It would not have escaped you that we ha have been living amid the first global mass trauma event for several decades arguably the first of its kind since World War II. And after the pandemic ends, its effects will linger across societies for years. The pandemic is creating bereavement on a huge scale. For loved ones, the rapid deteriorations seen in some COVID-19 cases when patients go from mildly symptomatic to death's door in days, make emotional preparation hard. Restricted visits meant that those important conversations didn't happen. We're all familiar with those pictures of people at others' windows. Or the rituals following a death were thrown out of the window with socially distanced funerals. And we can remember the Queen sitting on her own in Westminster Abbey. And as there are continuous reminders of the virus with daily reports of cases and deaths, that too can trigger traumatic feelings and memories. And what makes the experience even more complicated is that whether it's a fatal shooting or a burning building or a rocket attack in Israel and Palestine, the evidence is clear that communal gatherings and social networks are crucial for adequate recovery. It becomes a problem and slower healing process when we can't be together. And the nature of the pandemic, as well as being physically distant from one another throws up other difficulties in being able to process the trauma that has been experienced. Does a death from a virus give the same narrative to other kinds of mass trauma? It can't be seen. Who is the enemy? What is it we are fighting? What is the never again cautionary tale? What we know for sure is that the pandemic brought death home to all of us, and particularly those working in health and social care. As a whole community, we experienced the fragility of life. They were only X amount years old. They were fit and healthy. Um, earlier this year, the uh, House of Commons Health and Social Care Committee uh, did a report on uh, the workforce uh, about burnout and resilience. 
and wrote in social care, colleagues faced heartbreak at the excess deaths of those for whom they were caring. Heartbreak is an interesting word to use. In care homes, residents become like family. They are known and loved. And I guess heartbreak is expressed in many of our communities where we have seen a great deal of loss and grief. And that can have a profound impact on those who are close to it. And that brings me on to talk about moral injury. You may or may not be familiar with the term moral injury. It's been around for a while, particularly in military scenarios. But more and more, we are seeing the term used to describe the condition of frontline workers responding to the pandemic. Moral injury is an inner conflict based on our own moral self-assessment of having inflicted or failed to prevent significant harm. Its symptoms are excessive guilt, loss of meaning, anger, and shame. Now in a military context, we can see this quite clearly, seen in service personnel where they were unable to save life, or where serving personnel have experienced mass death or questions around whether force is morally justified in the situations they found themselves in. When something happens that is in conflict with our own beliefs and values, and the nature of war, that's seen up close. And we can start to see why that term then is becoming more popular to describe the experience of some frontline workers. A more detailed description has it as this, moral injury originates at an individual level when a person perpetuates, fails to prevent, or bears witness to a serious act that transgresses deeply held moral beliefs and expectations which leads to inner conflict because the experience is at odds with their personal core ethical and moral beliefs. And it can also be at an organisational level when serious acts of transgression have been caused by or resulted in a betrayal of what is culturally held to be morally right in a high stakes situation by those who hold legitimate authority. Moral injury in the context of the pandemic and healthcare has occurred when a care professional feels they were forced into decisions or actions that go against their values and principles and that causes harm to another person. If you haven't seen uh, the drama that was on Channel 4, Help, uh, I encourage you to uh, watch it on, uh, on all four. Um, the drama really helped to show some of the reality of the experience of going against a person's beliefs and values or their morals in the situation they found themselves in. Think about visiting. When visiting stops in care homes, imagine telling a loved one that they couldn't visit. That's not natural. Or the PPE that had to be worn or the lack of it and unable to protect oneself because it wasn't there to be available and wasn't and therefore not able to protect others knowing that a bigger risk was being created or those people who were at end of life where loved ones should be close by and who want to be close but having to be told they can't be a decision that's out of that care person's hands but you're the one having to enforce it unable to save life. Nothing could be done. And for those working on a night shift and seeing people dying with body bags, leaving the home one after the other. There is trauma linked to multiple deaths. 
and the concern and the fear of inadvertently bringing the virus into somewhere or taking it home to families. And so workers staying in the care home and residing in there themselves to protect their family and not being with their family. And no time to grieve. It's been relentless and still is. So in the bleakness of this complica complicated grief and this trauma, how do we respond? Should we just leave this to the professionals? We could, but I think we're missing something about who we are if we do. Moral injury is essentially an existential and spiritual crisis and includes guilt and shame and meaninglessness and need for forgiveness for ourselves, for others and or God. And our Christian faith speaks to all these things. And so the role of spiritual and pastoral care in hospitals, in care homes, in our communities is critical at these times, not just for now, but for a long time to come. In fact, more and more research is showing that conventional mental health services and standard cognitive based therapies, whilst very good and necessary, lack some of the moral concepts and language that is required to deal with the recovery process. Anxiety reduction, dealing with grief, forgiveness and reconnecting with the community. And that's not confined just to the work of a chaplain or a pastoral visitor or the clergy, but the whole religious community. We need to be that welcoming, inclusive community in order to facilitate ritual and worship activity for others. We all have a part to play in our communities to offer pastoral care that addresses mercy repentance, forgiveness, prayer and contemplation, divine justice, hope and affirmation. Providing that space for people to talk, being an understanding and listening ear who is able to give time is more important than you can realise. I've shared with you how circumstances of loss and in great numbers can make grief complicated, how the experience of that can be termed as moral injury. And it's important to recognise that those of us involved in chaplaincy, pastoral care, lay or ordained are not immune to similar effects. And sometimes the trauma that others experience can transfer to those who care for them. We too can suffer an erosion of moral conviction, sense of hopelessness, an inability to fix things and a loss of trust in leadership. But by being aware of what it is you are suffering, I hope you realise that this is actually something that can be worked through. There is hope. We need to look after ourselves. Balancing work, play and rest is essential to our human functioning. Identifying healing activities, creating art, enjoying music, spending time with family, friends, enjoying nature, traveling, taking time off, pursuing hobbies, simply resting and relaxing. Reconnecting our bodies is especially useful. Exercising, dancing, getting a massage, engaging in activism and no trauma voluntary work. Tend to your spiritual needs and find a way to restore faith. And there's great restorative value in being able to step back from our own work and put things into perspective. And with that, I will hand over to Abby. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, I'm a chaplain in the Woodlands Care Home, which is in Poynton in Cheshire. Um, we're quite a large nursing home with um, two specialist dementia units and two other units. And we've had quite a busy time through um, the last 18 months, as you can imagine. And I'm going to take us through a few different ideas, very short um, exercises that may be helpful 
um, in the three little chunks I've got today. Um, in this first section, I wanted to give you a little taster of mindfulness, which I'm sure very many of you will have previously come across mindfulness. It's very trendy at the moment. And if you Google, um, you will find hundreds of different ideas all claiming to be examples of mindfulness. And there's a handout that you'll be sent after today, which includes a link to one particularly excellent example, which is our own Kate Lesueur, and um, demonstrating how you can mindfully wash your hands, which is very useful because, of course, um, we all have to wash our hands lots at the moment. Um, but I wanted to show you an exercise now that doesn't require anything. You don't need to have access to soap and water or any fancy equipment. So we're just going to do a couple of minutes of um, kind of body awareness, which is one of those examples that's now often sold as mindfulness. But I certainly came across it. Um, I think in sixth form college, I was first taught this by a nun in RE as an introduction to a different way of praying. So it's much older than the, the um, latest trend. Um, so if you're seated somewhere, it, it might be a good idea if you want to put your feet quite firmly on the floor. Um, and if you're on a chair or a settee with a back to it, sit well back in it so you can feel um, yourself seated in the chair. And we're just going to begin with some deep breathing. And we'll breathe in through our noses and then out through your mouth. I'm going to do that a couple more times in through our nose and out through our mouth. In through our nose and out through our mouth. And just hopefully we begin to feel that slowing us down. I'd now like us to become more aware of the sensation of our own bodies. And we'll begin by noticing the feeling of our feet pressing against the floor. And then draw up your toes within your shoes or your slippers or whatever you're wearing. Just tighten up your feet and then just let them relax. And we're going to move up our legs. So we're going to push our feet down into the floor. So you'll feel your calves starting to tense. And then let those relax. And next we're going to pull our stomachs in, pull our tummies right in, as if we're trying to touch them to our back. So all your stomach muscles are tense. And then let them relax. Moving up to the shoulders, if you raise your shoulders and tense them up. Hold them for a couple of seconds and then let them relax. And moving down to our hands, if you clench your fists up, so they're really tight. And then let them relax. And last of all, we're going to screw up our faces and I promise not to look at anyone else on the panel. Screw our faces right up and then let those relax. So we've worked through the whole of our body and we'll just relax our shoulders a bit now and do a couple more of those deep breaths. And once more in through the nose and out through the mouth. And hopefully now that's helped you feel back in your body rather than in your mind and nice and relaxed. All ready now for a short break. <laughs> so we're going to have five minutes break and return at 10 past two. So you've just got time to stretch your legs or if you've got to, the kettle already hot, maybe grab a quick drink and we'll begin back at 10 past two. Well, welcome back everyone and thank you for the invitation to participate today. I'm Sarah. I work four days a week as a chaplain in a large Methodist care home in Bedford and supported living flats next door to the home. 
I came from working much of my life in parish ministry and one day a week I offer spiritual direction and supervision for directors within the St Albans scheme, diocesan scheme and I feel that all these aspects of my work nourish the others. It's rather appropriate that I've got the memorial slot um, to present today as I will the care home I'm in is actually a memorial itself to two sisters killed in a car accident in their teens. Memorials, we've all had experience of memorials, but I hope that these reflections will help us in our thoughts. I want to begin with a really short poem by Mary Oliver. Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. When we're planning a memorial, I think there's some really basic things we have to consider. Um, they might be for individuals or for a group or community or even the nation. Think of the memorial of the tomb of the unknown soldier in Westminster Abbey. Memorials that are temporary and those that are permanent and problems can arise when perceptions differ. Um, those who think something is permanent and others think it's temporary. I understand there have had to be negotiations over the COVID memorial wall of hearts outside St Thomas's Hospital. There are memorials events that are religious and those that are not, those for people of all faiths and none. And that is the great gift of memorials encompassing the enormity of our difference, holding that dignity of difference. I think the purpose for memorials, um, Jesus as, you know, our faith is incarnational. And therefore, it's no surprise that we need things of our senses to remember someone by. Charles Wesley wrote, one family we dwell in him, one church above beneath, though now divided by the stream, the narrow stream of death. We all walk past rose, um, memorials that have just been, just happened overnight. Um, there was one in Bedford this week outside a tattoo studio. And the vigils that have taken place recently, I think, offer a great sense of solidarity and action in the face of sheer impotency. Timing, I think, is all important as to memorial. I think the ones that spring up are to help contain shock. But other times, for instance, it took 10 years before I was able to bury the ashes of the son of some friends of mine who killed himself when he was 27. Permanent memorials take on all sorts of guises, as we know, from gravestones, tree planting, memorial gardens, war memorials, bulbs, um, memorial walks, photographs, statues. There's a special statue in Bedford of Trevor Huddleston's head. And sometimes when no one's around, I just go and feel it. And somehow it acts as a prayer for me, for Africa, for personal courage, and for a sense of perspective on difficulties. Of course, there are benches. At work, I put up a poster now every month to remember those for whom this is their first anniversary of death. Memorials in relation to COVID, I think it's far too soon to determine what we might need nationally to memorialise this pandemic. I've been reading a remarkable book called Pale Horse by Laura Tilly that some of you might be familiar with on the Spanish flu pandemic. And really her whole thesis is that she felt that its impact socially was greater than the two world wars put together um, in the last century. I think all memorial services need space. 
silence or music for reflection. Because as we've heard from previous speakers, every person is going to feel something different. And so space I feel is integral. Memorial events such as vigils, services, concerts, silent time, walks, I think are so important here at work. The staff and sometimes residents, we make a guard of honour as the funeral directors take away the body of someone who's just died. And I think that that really is really helpful to the home. It's the sort of first beginning really of, of grieving that person. I frequently do services for individuals, for those unable to attend a funeral. We've had so many staff who've lost loved ones abroad and um, the service is personalized for the, and allows time for the bereaved to share a few memories, but also is quite formal, you know, a commendation um, that they, because they're not able to attend the funeral. I think that all memorial services or events must have spiritual nourishment at the heart of their purpose. Of course, in parish life, All Souls, 2nd of November, I found to be an incredibly important point in the liturgical year to invite people back and have a general invitation to the whole parish. And we'd have so many people come who never came to church otherwise other than perhaps Christmas, it's really significant. In the care home, we, I've inherited two types of memorial services every year. The first is in the middle of the year when we focus on those who have died in the past 13 months. And then at the end of November, we have a light up a life service, which of course comes from the hospice movement. And we invite um, relatives, to come before COVID, they came, they come on Zoom now. Um, and we have a tree where we actually tie the names on and that feels an important aspect of the service. Anointing, I think is something that is incredibly important for some um, as a part of their healing through, through grief. So to sum up what I feel liturgical memorials um, are, is they are to offer sacred space, to give people permission to grieve and pray for their dead as an act of love, to provide solidarity with others mourning, to have a time for thanksgiving, remembering and commending, and to recognise the great need for lament. Um, Walter Brueggemann, in his recent book, virus as summons to faith and in his older book the spirituality of the psalms explores the whole paradigm of orientation disorientation and reorientation and i think memorials have so much to do with disorientation and reorientation we're never going to go back to the original um, orientation place the landscape of loss and bereavement and mourning is moving us towards that new landscape, that reorientation. I think liturgical memorials are also to create hope. Um, and of course, penitence and absolution is sometimes incredibly helpful. The content and practicalities, there are some um, resources that can be sent out if you wish, but I think familiarity um, if it's a Christian service then obviously the Lord's Prayer and well-known hymns and a familiar Bible passage. A time for reading out the names I think is very important. Space for reflection. Something to take away with you whether it's a little card with a piece of rosemary stapled on or a beautiful service booklet or something to take away. And I think in care homes, absolutely 30 minutes is, is maximum time. And when we have people there, refreshments, however simple afterwards, I think is part of the, the whole, whole 
healing time. As with funerals, I always feel how one conducts a memorial service is as important as the content. You know, the calm and hurried, um, as a friend expressed it, we're trying to embrace all present in Christ's love. And I think we do that by how we do, how we do it rather as much as the content. Of course, the liturgical year is a living memory of the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus. And I think I still feel the greatest memorial we have as Christians is the Eucharist. Do this in memory of me. And it brings everything together, all our emotions, hopes, fears, pain, joys, so that somehow we can begin to be remembered both within ourselves and as a community. And so, as I, I want to end with a, with a poem I wrote, I, I have a Eucharist service on the nursing unit at their request every week. And before, um, during Passion Tide, I, I wrote this, this poem. Pandemic Easter, Passion Tide is here, anamnesis of Eucharistic enactment, the passion realized here, now. Residents assemble, hoisted, wheeled, expectant. Histories gathered, griefs acknowledged, all held within the boundary of liturgical timelessness. Passion tide is here. Amidst the dropped books, the distressed cries, the croaking voices, the hand sanitizer and face masks the buzzers and the steady hum of the oxygen tank. The familiar drama unfolds. Passion tide is here, the bread is broken, fraction gathering us into Christ's passion anew, remembering us. Fragmented brains remembered, searing emotions remembered. Stretched faith, remembered, pain and grief, remembered, and then, and then for a dazzling moment or two, we find that we have been remembered through the passion into the resurrection. Hallelujah. It's time now for Abby, second time with us. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for that wonderful poem. So this second exercise is a little bit different to the first one. The, the first um, exercise I took you through was really about centering in the present moment, but in ourselves and being very aware of our bodies. Um, there are sometimes times when we get into a bit of a panic <laughs> and we're very caught up in either worrying about the future or worrying about the past and in those kind of situations I find this can be quite a helpful exercise that we call five things um, I actually first learned it from a trauma specialist when I was working with children and young people in a previous career um, and we used it there when we were dealing with very difficult um, discussions which sometimes would throw young people into um, those very anxious points of life where they needed bringing back into the room. And that's essentially what this is about. It's about making us very conscious of where we are in the present moment. Now, before I do this exercise, there's five things, just to, as a note to add to it. Um, it's five things because we work through all of our five senses to really place ourselves back in the here and now. Um, but obviously there are some people that don't have access to all five senses and there are also times when it might be unsafe to use taste or unpleasant to use smell and um, so you can I, I tend to go either five things or three things just because three feels a better number than four um, but do adapt it according to your circumstances but I'm going to take you through the full five things now so first of all um, we're going to 
notice five things that are around us. And what I'd like you to do is actually look for the five things, but name them. Um, obviously, we're all on mute, so we won't hear one another, but actually say out loud what you're looking at. So I am seeing a picture that I have on my wall of Iona. I'm seeing uh, my diary on the desk. Outside the window, I'm seeing some trees and the leaves blowing them. I'm seeing our memorial candle, which is on my window sill. And as usual, under my desk, I can see a bit of a mess of several bags that I've dumped there. So now we're going to move on to four things we can hear. I can hear the clock ticking in the room that I'm sitting in. And I don't know whether you've been hearing this, I've been speaking, but we also have the lift works in the next room to me and I can hear the lift shuddering with itself. And I can very softly hear the voices of some people in the next room. And I can hear the leaf blower outside, someone's obviously tidying up our grounds. And after noticing four things we hear, I'm going to focus now on three things that we can touch and do actively feel, whether with your hands or with the bit of your body that's touching them. So I'm feeling my solid chair arms underneath my hands and the floor underneath my feet. And I'm also going to reach out and touch a book so I quite like the feel if you flick through the pages of the book. So next two things that we can smell. In here I can smell the cleaning um, stuff that we use because I gave my window sill very sticky a good clean before. And I can faintly smell the coffee that I made myself in the break. So I'm going to end by I don't know if you'll all have something to taste hand, but I have still got that coffee beside me. So I'm going to have a slurp of coffee and end by tasting that. So hopefully we're all very much present in the moment after that. And I think we're going on to our panel discussion now. Firstly, a huge thank you to all our speakers this afternoon for all that you shared with us. Really grateful to you for the diversity of insights that you've brought. And we do have some questions for you. Before I um, introduce the questions, uh, I'm just going to say one of the questions was, <laughs> is there a transcript? Because I can't write it all down fast enough. Uh, we don't have a transcript, but we are recording and the recording will be made available afterwards. So um, if you want to listen again, revisit any of the particular parts, then you can do that through listening to the recording again afterwards. And I'm grateful to all our speakers for agreeing to be recorded as they brought um, what they've shared with us this afternoon. Uh, so turning um, to some of the questions that we've received, um, one that I'd like to put to Abby was speaking about death to young children is another difficult one, including giving them time to talk, time to talk it through and ask questions. Sorry, I've not read that very well. I'm going to do that again. Speaking about death to young children is another difficult one, including giving them time to talk it through and ask questions. Any thoughts? That was from Jim. And Abby, I wonder whether there's something you might um, share with us from your experience of talking with children about death. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I briefly alluded to, to my past career. I, um, I've only been in ministry since 2018 and prior to that I was a youth and community worker and worked for Bernardo's. Um, and for the last six years of that time I was managing their trauma services um, in the northwest of England. So we did a lot of work with children around loss, which included some around death, although there was many other sorts of loss as well. Um, and I suppose first I'd like to thank Jim for raising the question, because I do think it's really important. Mm -hmm. It's something we've certainly learnt in, in more recent years, that we shouldn't try and shield children from death. 
and um, that it is really important um, that we share accurate information with them as they start to experience death um, in their own lives, but also these days, of course, through exposure to the media. Um, and my first thought would be that the starting point should usually be responding to the children's questions, whether they're verbalised or whether they come out in other ways. So um, being attuned to children and they will ask questions and they may well actually ask questions to people slightly removed from the family, especially if there's been an in incident in the family, if there's been a recent loss, they might not want to upset their mum or dad. Um, so they may well ask, you know, the, the local lay worker or minister if, um, if they're in touch with them. So the, the first tip would be to take your cue from the question and respond to it accurately, but in an age appropriate way. Um, at the same time, if it's, if the questions are arising from a situation like the current pandemic, I think it's quite important that we manage children's exposure to it as well. Um, and I know this is terribly hypocritical of me because during the first wave of COVID, I was the world's worst. <laughs> um, we really need to avoid having the news on constantly um, because with this 24 hour news culture we've got now, it, it is overkill really. And it, it can be quite difficult and distressing for people. Um, and at risk of showing my middle class credentials, I highly recommend CBBC news coverage as well for children in that kind of age group because they do it so sensitively and they have specialist advisors um, who really know how to deal with, with difficult questions with children. Um, the, I would also say that we need to be aware of likely responses from children at different ages. Um, and particularly, sometimes people panic a bit. Um, we certainly found this in our work at Bernardo. So for example, if you tell a four year old who's experienced their grandma dying, that grandma's gone to be in a lovely place where there's no pain and everyone's very happy, you really shouldn't panic when that four year old then says she wants to go and be with grandma because it probably doesn't indicate she's feeling very low. It's just a reflection of the edited highlights you've given of your understanding of where grandma's gone. And so it's important to both to be prepared for that. And then if that happens, to respond by pointing out things like the permanence of death and the separation from other people, um, because we don't want to, you know, we, we need to acknowledge the difficult side as well. We need to acknowledge that, um, Yes, as Christians, we believe there is something better after this, but there's also a great deal of pain because it means separation from the people that we know and love now. Um, it's good to help children to express their feelings as well, um, both with a personal bereavement or with difficult world situations. And there's lots of exercises. Again, uh, you know, Google is our friend, whatever did we do before it? Um, but one of the things we used to find really helpful was feeling trees. So you just, it's a lovely craft activity to do with a child as well. You create a tree trunk and you make lots of leaves with different feelings on just words um, like sad or happy or angry or frustrated. And you can encourage children within a group or within the family um, to just take the leaf of how they're feeling today as a way of exploring it. Um, and you know, anything like that also helps them to build up a vocabulary because that's the most important final thing I think I'd want to say is help children at whatever age to build up their own vocabulary so they can express how they're feeling about death and about all the other difficult things in their life because children need to communicate their feelings and if they can't do it using words they'll do it using behaviours and sometimes in quite difficult ways for others or in quite dangerous ways for themselves. Um, so all of that's important and just be there for them because children, um, they do cope better than we think often and, and the single most important thing for them coping with any kind of difficulty is having safe, reliable adults in their lives that can help them through it. Thank you, Abby. And I think what you've said there applies so much to adults as well as to children. We too need safe places as Okay, raised at the beginning, where is our safe place? 
And we also need the language and that takes me on to a question from Lynn. How can we encourage people to talk about death without others thinking we are morbid? And Emma, I think that resonates with some things that you were saying to us at the beginning. I wonder if you might like to respond to Lynn's question there. How can we encourage people to talk about death without others thinking we're morbid? Thank you. I, I'm not sure how helpful my answer will be because I'm just going to say just do it um, and and that's basically I talk about death a lot and people have got used to it and um, I tell people like if people ask why am I talking about it I'll tell them it's because it's going to happen to all of us um, and the more we talk about it the less weird it is um, and it is little things like there are lots of places on the internet where you will find death positive people and you will find language and um, so I can maybe put a list of things together that we can send out um, of, of some great places that you can find those resources um, and I think it is just about maybe picking up on other people's cues um, so one of the things that I do as chaplain in the care home is I help our residents um, fill out their final wishes forms that's a, just a, a, a document that looks at how they would like to be looked after if they come towards the end of their life but also um, what they would like to happen to them after they die so funeral arrangements and that kind of thing and some residents I'll approach with that and they don't want to talk about it um, and other times um, residents are really really keen because they, they, they want to get that information out there and um, I have one lady who was a new resident a couple of weeks ago and I broached the subject with her and she said to me just tell my just ask my son and daughter they'll tell you everything and um, and yesterday I was in the home and she was sitting in the lounge waiting to go through for our lunch. So I was just sat down talking, like we're just nattering. And she just said to me, you know, when I die, this is what I think I'd like to happen. And, and she didn't want to talk about it last week. And then this week she just tells me everything. Um, and, and it's just about being open um, so we can have, you know, if, if something's on the TV and someone has died, let that be a starting point. Prince Philip's funeral was an amazing starting point for conversations about those kind of things. So let pick up those cues that you can. Um, and, and if people think you're morbid, just tell them you're a realist um, and that we're fighting the last taboo and we will talk about death because it's important. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. So that's the encouragement to us all just to have courage to start those conversations and allow them to happen. Uh, we have a question from Ruth. How do we raise awareness of the impacts of pandemic grief amongst congregations in a way that exposes positively and helps people travel through the range of behaviours, attitudes and responses people display in church, e.g. resistance to wearing masks, caution at physical contact or over pushiness about the same, etc. I wonder whether you've any thoughts and I, I don't think it's um, this isn't restricted to congregations could be groups of people in other settings as well, I think. Now, how do we encourage that awareness of the impacts? I'm happy to uh, give some yes, thoughts. Please, Chris, that. Please, thank you. <laughs> and that is an interesting question. Um, I think it's important to recognise that this is not normal and and what we go through and the rules that we're given is not normal and um, that's important for people who struggle with those things uh, when we start to normalize what we're doing um, we're, what we're saying is then it's okay to be socially distanced from one another to not express ourselves uh, as, as we normally would so uh, we need to be aware of that I think in our churches and our congregations we need to have that space and to let people know that we have that space where people can come and do what they need to do in response to what they've gone through. When I was talking about sort of moral injury and that feeling of guilt, it's not that somebody has gone out and done something wrong <laughs> uh, that somebody is to blame. It's just that that person feels, which is why it's moral injury, they feel and have experienced guilt even though they had no choice and it wasn't their fault. So there needs to be space for repentance. Um, there needs to then be space for forgiveness and to explore what that means for people 
um, you know, I, I, I worked with somebody over a long period of time who, who was, uh, when I was a, a, a chaplain in the Air Force and a pilot, who'd experienced immense guilt, even though he had not personally done anything wrong. And he just needed to know for himself that he was forgiven by God, not that he had much of a faith, but it was still important to him. There is something about understanding and acknowledging our identity as being known and loved by God and the church does that <laughs> and is in a prime position to do that for people that we have an identity because we're known and loved by God and that there is hope hope because we are not alone hope because this isn't normal and um, hope because of trust in God so people will come with all different experiences People will come with all different thoughts of what's right or what's wrong. Um, the, the best thing we can do is provide, and we've said it already, <laughs> is provide that space for all those things to be explored and for us to be that inclusive, welcoming community so that can happen. Thank you, Christian. Um, I think that picks up one of the other questions that uh, was just there in the Q&A about how we do make that space now for people in memorials. That's something we uh, we could perhaps come back to a little bit further. Time is, is ticking on, so I'm going to turn to uh, another of our questions here. Thinking about memorials, we may need to restrict numbers. Is it okay to ask people to RSVP? It goes against the grain but to continue to protect everyone, it feels necessary too. Sarah, I wonder whether, um, how you feel about yeah. asking people to book in a place for a memorial. Yeah, well, it's interesting because we've only been able to do it on Zoom um, so far. And um, in consultation with my manager, it looks as if that will be the same for Light Up for Life, that we won't be actually having um, relatives there um, but we all, always have asked for an RSVP um, for catering and, and that makes a great excuse a great reason why you need an RSVP um, um, yeah because normally I would wouldn't dream of that but I think we that's another acknowledgement of how difficult this time is isn't it um, that, that actually we do need to know whether we've got safe numbers So use the the practical reasons yes, that we exactly. have yeah. um, to enable us to to make the, yeah. the space a safe space. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, we are coming towards the end of our Q and A time, but one of the the questions there was, how have you each? Um, how has the pandemic uh, impacted on each of you as, as chaplains in your roles? I wonder if any of you um, want just to say something um, from your own experience about how this has impacted on you. i start with Crispian, would you be able to say something for us? Yeah, I think um, um, for me, as uh, in my role as head of chaplaincy, I, I, I get to um, visit different places. So other members of the panel are, are more embedded in, in homes. Uh, but I think, you know, in terms of chaplaincy, uh, in terms of who we are, our mission, um, uh, you know, what we're called to do, you know, for such a time as this, that actually um, all, all, you know, God's grace, gifts, um, that we have have been used uh, across the piece uh, to their most and uh, it's just uh, been astounding and privileged really from my position to be able to see how chaplains have been able to engage and support not only residents but their families and our colleagues through, through what's been such a difficult time and how much chaplains have been relied upon. Thank you Crispian. Other members of the panel, is there anything that you would like to share from your experience of the impact this year, Emma? Yeah, I, I would just say um, I was shocked at how 
um, it impacted me at the beginning. Uh, so the, the home that I'm in, um, we didn't get COVID at all in the first wave. Um, it was only it was this time last year that we got COVID in the home. So we got through the whole first wave. Um, but I live with my parents who are both over 60. Um, and my dad's got COPD. And I was the only one leaving the house and I was going into the care home and I was coming back and I was on a constant state of high alert am I carrying COVID either into the care home because I was that I had to go and do the supermarket shopping or am I carrying it into to my parents mm -hmm. um and I remember speaking to my manager one day and just saying I'm I've got I'm feeling anxious but I'm not I don't know what I'm anxious about and she just said you're anxious because nothing you, you're on alert all the time there's nothing normal at the moment um and I think that was it I was concerned about everybody else's safety and I think others would say the same you know we, we were going in so we were the ones who could potentially carry this virus mm -hmm. um and that was that's kind of where I was at and um, so from a personal kind of perspective I just wanted everybody else to be safe and I was terrified that I would be the one to carry COVID in mm -hmm. thank you Emma Sarah yeah, that very much chimes with my, my experience of uh, high anxiety in the first lockdown because, of course, we weren't getting all the testing. Um, but I think what I've found is that um, it, it, I feel as if the staff are using the chaplain, if you like, for want of a better phrase, far, far, far more than um, previously. I feel as if I've got to know staff in a completely yes. different way. And that's been really special. Thank you. Yeah. Abby and Kate, anything you would like to add? Um, just following on from what Sarah said, uh, the other thing that has been much more time supporting the relatives, because whereas the relatives used to just come in and see their, their loved one with us they've not been able to do that so we've become kind of bridge between the two and helping with zoom calls and things like that so that's actually been really positive um, but I think there's been a kind of constant change in the role as well the home that I'm in had an outbreak early in the first wave which in some ways was really good actually because I caught it at work so then I've had it and, and actually in terms of the anxiety levels that that helped um, but um, yeah, there, there's been constant changes because, of course, that then meant that we couldn't do lots of the things we'd normally be doing. And then once we were out of outbreak, then um, we couldn't have visiting ministers in. So whereas I used to leave very little worship at work because we had lots of visiting churches coming in. I've been leading lots because we've had no visitors and because we've had to do it unit by unit instead of one service for everyone to allow social distancing. So. Yeah, there's been constant change, really, but, um, yeah. Mm. Thank you, and thank you for that contrasting experience of um, Emma's anxiety around not having it and, and your own suffering of being um, subject to the virus and then the, the relief in one sense of that. So thank you. Kate, anything you would like to add at this point? Just very quickly, like Crispy, and I'm not embedded in a in a, a home or a retirement living scheme, but I did spend some time in the first wave in one of our homes where, where they didn't have a chaplain for a period. And I think the things that really struck me there was, first of all, that that, that fear of the, of the staff there and my colleagues there, that was really powerful. But also it just really brought home to me the power of listening and ritual. Um, in, in their context, in, in the things that they had been through, and, and just how some quite simple things made a vast difference to the people there. Thank you. I'm going to move on into our final part of the afternoon, uh, and Abby's going to lead us in another activity. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Um, this is the one activity that really won't fit into five minutes, so I'm going to explain it rather than do it fully with you. <laughs> um, but the last thing we wanted to share was, um, which I'm sure again some of you will be very familiar with, is the idea of examine or the review of the day, which is a prayer practice from the Ignatian tradition. Um, allegedly it's the one prayer that St Ignatius used to tell the Jesuits that they weren't allowed to skip however busy they were. I don't know how true that is, but I can see why it might be true. 
Um, and it's also different, apart from not fitting into five minutes, it's also different from the other exercises that um, we've looked at because it is looking back rather than the others, which have been very much about grounding in the present. But I think in after difficult times, such as we've been through, it is helpful sometimes to just take a small chunk of time and reflect on it. And the idea with the examine is that um, our emotions actually can tell us a lot about where God is acting in our lives. And that by looking back in a systemic way, um, we can become more attuned to what is taking us closer to God and maybe what is a barrier between us and God. And the examine, I think, can also be adapted even for people with no religious belief. Um, and it can be made very simple as well for using with, with young people or people living with dementia. It can be as simple as saying, um, what is the worst thing that's happened to you today and what's the best thing that's happened today? And then just spending a moment, um, if it is in a religious context, saying thank you to God for what's been good. Um, but to um, do the exam properly, you really need at least 10 or 15 minutes and I'll talk you through, so we won't have time quite to do it properly, um, but you can take any period of time. The traditional way is to do it at the end of each day as a review of that day. Um, but since we're going to be doing it very quickly, I suggest we do it now as a review of the last 90 minutes and what we've shared together on this webinar. So the first um, part of the exam is just to reflect back over that time Perhaps imagine it as though you're watching, um, for those of you old enough like me to remember video recorders that you could fast forward and watch in, in fast motion. Imagine you're doing that, flick through what we've been um, sharing this afternoon about everything Emma shared and Christian and Sarah and the questions and the answers that we've had. And just look through it without any judgment, first of all. And then once you've done that, look again, but this time be noticing particularly those things that you're grateful for. And perhaps actually name the things that you feel grateful for in hindsight um, that have been helpful to you this afternoon. And once you've done that, um, the next stage is to look back again, but with particular reference to your emotions. So really notice the feelings that you felt. It might be that there were times when you felt anxious at something someone said, and it might be helpful to think, why did that provoke anxiety? Was it because it resonated with something that's coming up for you? Or was it because you felt that maybe in the past it didn't fit with how you've done something? You might have felt frustration at some point, and is that because that part of what we were talking about wasn't relevant to you? Or was it because it was keying into something that you're having to do at the moment that you're being drawn away from? And bear in mind that um, Ignatius tells us that our emotions can be an insight to where God's acting in our life. And then after reviewing, looking at your feelings, the last step in the exam is to um, offer to God the next chunk in your life. So in the context of reviewing this webinar, you might want to pick up what you want to do next from today. If there's anything you want to take forward or take into your own ministry and maybe offer that to God and ask God to help you to do that and to bless that work. And if you're like me, you might want to ask God to help you remember to do the thing that you intend to do after today. Amen. I'm going to hand back over to Kate now to finish off for the day. Thank you, Abby, for that. And thank you so much to all of our speakers this afternoon for sharing your insights and your wisdom. Um, I'm sure everybody will have things to, to take away. I've just been kind of scribbling down as we've gone along, just some of the things that, that sometimes I need to remind myself of that you have highlighted for me. So 
Emma talking about the way that we all grieve differently, that there's no right and wrong way of doing it. Um, and that it's OK to say to somebody else, no, I don't do it like that. I do it like this. Um, to Crispian, to, talking about the importance of making space um, and, and the, the part that we can have in that, uh, both in chapels, but in, but in church as well. And some of the questions that we haven't had time to answer um, have been about the, the ways in which we can create space for people to, to talk about their experiences. And Abby offering us those, you know, what on the face of it are quite simple things, but actually go very deep, very quickly. And, and things that, that we can all do, either for ourselves or for the people we're ministering to. And Sarah reminding us of the importance of, of ritual. So of Eucharist, the power of the Eucharist. And, and that's been another loss as well, hasn't it? That, you know, for so long, um, we weren't able to share the Eucharist with one another. Um, and also bringing in anointing there. It's not a very Methodist thing. We, we don't do a lot of anointing in the Methodist church, but I think there is something that, that we can learn there from other traditions um, uh, to explore about what it is that anointing can, can bring to people um, through that particular ritual. So thank you so much to all our speakers. Thank you too to Tricia from the Learning Network for the huge amount of work she's uh, put in behind the scenes over the last few months and for chairing our, our Q&A for us so well. And thank you to Funmi who's been uh, hiding with a turned off camera but who has been pressing the buttons as we've gone along in all the right places. So thank you for that. And, and thank you to you for coming. Um, th there's no point us sitting here talking to ourselves about this. Uh, so thank you for coming. Thank you for those of you who've um, asked questions and apologies, those of you we haven't managed to get uh, answers to in the time. But thank you too for all the care that you give to the people that you're with uh, day in, day out, for the difference that you make to people's lives. As we know, grief is a natural process following a loss and most people will naturally start to feel better in time. Um, it's not that we forget those we have loved or get over what has been lost, but the pain does become less intense. And occasionally we know it doesn't work like that and a person may need more help. So we might suggest you get together a toolkit if you haven't already. There are national websites and helplines for people like the Samaritans and Bereavement Advice and Crews, but there may also be local groups where you are that you can signpost people to. And look out for the red flags that suggest someone might be really struggling and need extra help, some expert help that we might not be able to offer. So lasting intense feelings of grief, uncharacteristic episodes of rage. And of course, as you know, if someone is telling you that they intend to harm themselves or someone else, or if they're saying that they can't go on, then get help right away from the GP or the Samaritans or 999. So remember those questions that, that I asked at the beginning. Who do you talk to? How do you care for yourself? Where is your safe place? And as you are ministering to people through these really difficult, distressing circumstances, hold on to those things. It's a wonderful thing to be able to walk alongside someone in their darkest times. But we know that we can't care for others well if we don't look after ourselves. So remember, we can't fix everything, but good listening, good ritual, making the space, understanding the way these things work really does help. So thank you so much for coming.